Are you seeing my screen now? Yeah. And the presentation. Okay, so the introduction to social dynamics. Um, and this is going to be a kind of a, a really general um, lecture, so I'm not going to go into any kind of specifics because this is a kind of a broad field with with a lot of different different um, applications and models. I'm going to try to talk about them. Um, more of the basic principles um, and the basic modeling that's, that's been done. And this goes quite closely with uh, the kind of agent-based modeling uh, topic. So I kind of introduced a lot of that into the end. So <clears throat> this, this is kind of the outline. So, so the social numbers, um, first okay. a little bit of the history and overview of how this uh, social phenomena has been approached and what is the kind of mathematical history behind it. Um, then in the second part kind of thinking about these um, more modern approaches uh, and methods and how can they be applied and what, they, what do they have to offer. And then uh, in the third part, we're going to look a little bit about the uh, applications. All right. So, so the aim of kind of modern social dynamics um, is to be able to answer both questions, how and why is certain collective social phenomenon happening? And then studying emergence of ordered patterns in society. Um, what is also like interesting about this um, current situation and this new era is that we can design these micro level mechanisms um, and models which generate real world like micro level emergent behavior. Um, and social dynamics is a kind of a branch of social physics nowadays um, that deals with the laws, forces, um, and phenomena of change in society. So let's go to the, to the beginnings of this all. So kind of this classical overview, <clears throat> we can think this through uh, the Newtonian era um, and back then there was the kind of special specialization in science wasn't that big. So we were talking about the natural philosophy where mathematics um, like Euclidean, Euclidean geometry, early physics, like optics, uh, were still more closely um, like intermingled together with philosophy, political thought and other early sciences. But you can start to see this happening in the 17th century that um, the signs of developments in mathemat mat mathematical theory and methodology uh, that's beginning to affect a, a broader set of disciplines. And of course, there's a, there's a kind of uh, mutual interaction and, and feedback that mathematical methods get, to get more and more um, applied and then there becomes more mathematical insights as well and, and new methods based on the applications and this is what we're going to see as well so um, one example kind of um, could be also from this time could be Thomas Hobbes who was inspired by Euclid's geometry uh, also met Galileo Galilei and uh, kind of was very much inspired by his laws of, of motion and he then went on to uh, kind of first of all he, he thought 
based on this and based on um, Galileo's work that kind of nature must be um, deterministic and the same natural laws must also uh, apply to society without exceptions. And so he went on to describe this philosophy and in the most like well-known work is Le Leviathan, where he said that, um, so where he basically um, produced a, a picture of man as a, as a, this kind of mechanistic machine. <clears throat> then at the, at the kind of, um, next we can go uh, and look at the French mathematician, Marty de Condorcet, who said that, um, kind of laying out this same kind of idea, he said that all phenomena are equally susceptible of being calculated and all that is necessary to reduce the whole of nature to laws similar to those which Newton discovered with the aid of the calculus is to have a sufficient number of observations and the mathematics that is complex enough. Um, and this kind of already includes the idea that um, kind of this newborn idea um, of Newtonian uh, revolution in, in physics that um, people then extrapolate on other other stuff and, and human society as well. Um, and what we can then then see after this is that there's, for example, Thomas R. Malthus, who writes an essay on the principle of population, um, which is basically um, uh, kind of a trial, try, try and, uh, or trial to predict future social, societal scenario. Um, the central tenet uh, was that uh, due to the rate of human reproduction, that the popula population will increase at a kind of a geometrical ratio uh, and will double every 25 years or so. Uh, while the ability of Food production systems to grow, but it's only limited to ar arithmetic ratio. Um, and this would then leave in that uh, this will mean that in in uh, near future there will be a hunger and famine, unless birth rates would be decreased. Um, and yeah, this is something that can be thought of as. Uh, um, the beginning of population dynamics. Then also there was Auguste Comte, who was very much inspired by Newtonian physics. Um, he was actually the fir first to coin the term sociology. He also founded this very uh, influential positivist school in social sciences. Um, and basically he wanted to call this thing uh, this thing basically uh, social physics but there was I think there was other people already who were saying this and I think Ketele at least was one of those um, so positivists strongly also re reject this metaphysics and religious thought um, as the base of gaining understanding about the social phenomenon um, then if we look at the Laplace and Ketele, um, what they found was basically, or, or actually that it was already be before that the Moivre and Gauss found the normal distribution, but Laplace and Ketele then um, realized that it's, it's kind of the basis of social statistics, which you can describe many different phenomena um, in society and they are all normally distributed. Um, yeah, and then Ketele discovers that many regularities of these social numbers, um, yeah, they're normally distributed, uh, but 
here he had this influential book called Physique Sociale, so this is uh, social physics from 1835. Mm, then something that's interesting, um, kind of the Maxwell's work uh, on kinetics of gases was actually inspired by social statistics of, of Thomas Buckle. And Buckle was, um, was a historian and he was um, writing this a book about the history, um, like the, the laws of science and history. Um, and then Maxwell read it uh, and was very, very like influenced by this. So uh, we have this quote from Maxwell that those uniform uniformities which we observe in our experiments with quantities of matter containing millions and millions of molecules are uniformities of the same kind as those explained by Laplace and wondered at by Buckle rising from the slumping together of multitudes of causes, each of which is by no means uniform with the others. And we can kind of see the, the born of um, theoretical statistical physics here. Um, uh, and the idea that kind of Maxwell got from this is that you could actually assume uh, that the velocities of the particles um, in in gas, for example, that they would be normally distributed. And this assumption was only shown later to be true by Boltzmann. I think it, it was in 1872. Yes. Okay. Then kind of the, some of them, if we come to the uh, 20th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, you can see that um, there's, for example, the French socio sociologist, um, Emile Durkheim, who uh, studied this kind of different differentiation in society. So you could, you could kind of give this overview about uh, about the um, century that sociology itself it branched into many directions and and became a kind of multi paradigmatic uh, discipline uh, and it doesn't have a, a single definable goal as maybe for example economics might have uh, more clearly defined uh, and different theories. Uh, methods, they they coexist, um, but you can still kind of um, get this overarching theme that um, focus is on on temporal stability and emergence of norms, institutions, and individual behavior. So, so this word emer emergence is something that starts to come up in the mathematical terminology uh, or, or the sociological terminology already back then. <clears throat> so in contrast to mainstream economics, sociologists, um, they were a little bit cautious to embrace uh, two, reductionistic, two reductionistic models and for example, the equilibrium modeling that uh, neoclassical economics and economists did, um, they kind of um, avoided it in, in terms of, and maybe turned a little bit more towards kind of these heterodox um, tools and methodologies. Um, So if you think about a little bit more about what like why Durkheim and George Simmel, um, why I mentioned them here is that Durkheim was interested in the kind of rapid transition of society from agriculture 
society um, to this modern industrial society. And he's, he's then kind of studied the increasing special specialization of, of labor. Um, and what he found was what's kind of interesting. He found that there would be this um, deeper and deeper specialization between different professions. But at the same time, uh, these kind of different profession uh, or, or people and groups, they became more, more and more interdependent because at the same time, there was less and less generalists. Um, and this could be thought uh, as having already this kind of um, functional complexity, uh, which is a kind of concept derived from biology and systems theory. Yeah. <clears throat> then if we say something about the similes that he can be thought of as one of the first sociologists that then went on to build theories that emphasized, the, um, for example, the dynamics of, of triads uh, in um, interpersonal relationships. So, and web of group affiliation, affiliations. So in other words, uh, he was kind of pioneering some work already on, on trying to, what, what later then on uh, went on to be more formalized and uh, defined as a kind of what we now know as network science. <clears throat> and this work was done, I think, in the early um, 20th century, but the formalization was only done during 50s. So, and yeah, the difference between economics and mathematical sociology is basically that you were uh, economics we were trying to build causal models um, and they, there's this there's this um, still this kind of um, idealized um, nature of, of Newtonian mechanics at the basis and focused on equilibrium systems. So challenges in the traditional quantitative social sciences um, you could say that the, the word that already came up was the emer emergence and the way um, the problem problematic thing was to how to model and understand this emergent phenomena like, quantitatively and also kind of this you could see uh, that there are these really fast transitions and abrupt societal changes happening so uh, there was a, like a difference between the mic what happened on the micro level and macro level. And then methods were uh, social statistics, which uh, also had a focus on correlation and regression analysis. And this is then like a, um, you're trying to often find correlations between um, long, long, and trends. Uh, it's difficult to, to explain this kind of emergent abrupt phenomena. Then in economics, uh, yeah, you could say that it's causal, but it's still based on highly simplifying assumptions. There's, for example, this idea of homo economicus, which is basically the rational idealization of man as a, as a kind of able to know everything about the, um, uh, and make the kind of ideal choices in every, every situation. And this then guarantees uh, that in the aggregate level, um, the market works and has a correct price and, and so on. There was also these normal assumptions that were um, then during the formalization um, put into these models and um, they've been criticized um, like I think after 1950s quite harshly uh, because it's they don't seem to um, be able to explain the 
economic recessions and economic booms and and busts. And it was based on kind of this first principles uh, thing um, and equilibrium models. So the question then is that what is what does 21st century complex system science uh, what can it offer? So there are at least three big components: statistical physics, mathematical methods, and in a more maybe general sense, and then the kind of this computer science side and of course there's other like life sciences as well geology for example has played a role so uh statistical physics can kind of um this new broad broader understanding about first and second order phase transitions emergence macro level behavior is not the sum of its parts um universal theory of scale free properties um that tail distributions well this this might be a contested topic at the moment um, but it seems that there there are like at least um, a lot of these normality assumptions and and this uh, reliance on this kind of distributions has been uh, kind of in some sense at least um, diversified nowadays because we understand this that their distributions and that their possibilities also advanced microscopic modeling um, yeah and then in the mathematical methods you could kind of say that there's nonlinear dynamics and chaos and this kind of brings if not always an uh, ability to solve Solve problems, um, but it at, at least it brings this new kind of understanding um, about non-equilibrium modeling. And then, if you look at what happened during the 70s, 80s, um, there's catastrophe theory first, understanding about um, how these systems can be uh, driven through kind of a, for example, a cascade of different bifurcations and what can happen uh, in this in this uh, abrupt phase changes and then chaos theory as well so the sensitivity to initial conditions fluctuations around this fixed point mm. and then also path dependency which is something that um i don't know it's at least it's not that kind of a um it's not an old idea and it means that there's some his, uh, historical um, uh, that we can't actually predict a lot of the phenomenon that we see. Yeah, and then there's this kind of, uh, if you still think about the physics um, and its success in, in the early 20th century, then there's a really a um, very, very, um, big trust I think um, in calculus and analysis and then this kind of case theory uh, um, breaks some maybe holes into this for example Michel Baranger has this uh, interesting paper and says that in its widest possible meaning chaos can be considered as a collection of those mathematical groups that have nothing to do with calculus Um, and then also during this same time, this kind of idea about, for example, self-similarity, um, complexity from simple rules. Uh, so for example, the Mandelbrot set or, uh, and this kind of interesting, uh, maybe they were more, more of a kind of popularized back then, but they became kind of um, also more of a, a focus of study in different fields uh, and this kind of understanding about about their about this kind of phenomenon phenomenon existing um, they affected this larger consciousness 
Um, you could also say that uh, the graph theory and topology, uh, it started to develop all the way from, of course, from uh, 1736, when Gönigberg's bridge pro problem was um, worked on by Victor uh, Euler. And a new graph models, measures, classification of graph problems, um, random graph models and, and visualization techniques as well. They, um, they were kind of helpful in, in this sense that what we then have as a network science and what then kind of combined at the end of 90s, I, I think with physics and statistical physics. Uh, something more that's um, interesting and comes from maybe uh, kind of population biology is evolutionary game theory, um, where you can study how certain behavioral strategies can help species to achieve fitness, reproduction, flourish, and others to then um, to diminish. <laughs> And in the picture, you can see um, this basic basic cycle of evolutionary game theory. Um, um, and yeah, this this difference between evolutionary game theory and the normal game theory is is exactly that that you're bringing this kind of long time scale population. Um, population growth and, and fit, fitness uh, into the play. And then you're, for example, able to um, use these ideas uh, in uh, explaining why cooperation or some other kind of um, strategies, human social strategies have survived in our culture. And this is, of course, very hypothetical at the same time. But it's still kind of um, you're able to show by these games that um, and these models uh, that it could be one pl plausible way to um, develop these things. From 1950s onwards, of course, fundamental developments in computers and algorithms have enabled more advanced measures and simulations which have produced kind of this explosion in computational resources and explosion in data resources as well. So there's, there's more data, there's uh, better algorithms, um, there's um, understanding from computer science as well about computational com complexity. So maybe a, a little bit different notion of complexity, but, um, but it's also uh, somehow somehow meaningful and um, also very, very practical in, the, in thinking about how complex calculations can you actually, and computations can you actually have and how expensive those are in terms of time. Okay. Um, and then there's this uh, kind of computer uh, science, related uh, early agent-based model, which is called Game of Life on Conway from 1970. Um, and there's these simple rules uh, which can produce this emergent uh, behavior, uh, which, is, which was very interesting and has been very uh, kind of um, inspirational for other models as well. Um, so you can see here that um, the basic rules for a space that is populated is that each cell, cell with not one or no neighbors um, um, will die at least by solitude. I think there's, yeah, okay. Each cell with four or more neighbors dies as, the, as if by overpopulation and each cell with two or three neighbors survives. For a space that is empty or unpopulated, each cell with three neighbors becomes populated. 
And of course, this is somewhat of a gimmick at the time with no real applications on anything, but it kind of is an inspirational model and we, we will see soon that, that there are real, real kind of um, models that were then based on these ideas. So uh, how do we then approach this modeling of social phenomena and social problems? Uh, well, we can, uh, we need a kind of a, for emergent phenomena to, to, to be able to actually simulate them and, and show, show their dynamics and demonstrate them. Uh, we need some kind of a base unit that, um, and for many of these, for example, uh, models from statistical physics, it's, it's quite easy to think that there's, um, if we only exchange the basic, for example, atoms into the, um, with human agents, um, and think of, think those of, as somehow reminiscent of, uh, of elementary particles, where they're kind of diverse individual nature um, can be averaged out um, and thought as a, as a kind of probability distribution, um, then we might almost directly be able to use these models. And this is, for example, the case in, in, in Ising model that's been used, that have been used in, for example, studying group behavior. So if we just <coughs> exchange the atomic uh, magnetic dipole moments or spins as we know them uh, by, um, by agents and those, the directions of spin can then um, model different opinions, for example, um, then we can see that um, we can appro approximate this um, group, beha group behavior like um, phenomena. For example, there's this SNIDE, um, SNIDE model, which is an application of IC model. Um, there, the focus is on a pair of neighboring agents. Um, can see see here, um, and there are these simple update rules, and then we update them for each iteration. Um, and what we basically see is is very similar phenomenon that we see in the original Ising model, um, and this this if we then go on to uh, generalize this approach more. And this is what, what has been happening all the way from, uh, from 17th and 80s forward. Um, uh, this is kind of the generalized version. So we can describe social atoms as agents with, uh, with states. Um, they have social ties. Uh, which describe usually influence or interaction. Um, then we go on set up, setting up rules that define the kind of interaction or behavior uh, that we want to see in the real world. And then we start simulation by iterating the model a uh, few steps. Up, we update the states of the agents based on these rules. And then what we do is we change the parameter values, um, or of course, um, um, rerun the model multiple times and observe emergent behavior and um, those critical points we can find. And then uh, only a year after uh, the kind of Conway's uh, Game of Life, uh, there was this economic uh, uh, shelling. And um, he kind of came up with this simple model uh, where you have a, a matrix of, of n by n. And basically what you're, what you're going to do is that you're going to, um, this is the, um, this is the <clears throat> algorithm by which we, 
why would we make this um, simulation work? So you place the agents randomly to a uh, square matrix. You include each agent into one of two different groups uh, randomly at the beginning. And each agent has this kind of a threshold um, F um, of different group um, neighbors that they can stand before they relocate to new randomly chosen neighborhood. Um, so the basic idea is here that you study uh, the, um, the segregation in the sense that you can, um, if people only um, favor like the, the same kind of people, uh, maybe in network theory uh, or network science, we now nowadays call this homophily. Um, and what you can then then show and what happens is that for different uh, values of f, um, you can have a um, different kind of behavior and uh, there's this critical tolerance threshold at um, one third. Um, and what you see is that if f is below this one third, um, there's this random pattern at the beginning that remains, but in time, um, um, one initially random pattern remains, but in time it becomes random like. <clears throat> While for um, f is bigger than this threshold, the initial random pattern converts to this kind of segregated pattern that we see on the right. And then, uh, of course, this this is easy to kind of criticize this kind of model um, by saying that uh, this is an extremely reductionistic and extremely simplistic um, model. Uh, but at the same time, Schelling was saying that um, maybe we can think of this in in the sense that even in the case where we would have a completely random setup in the beginning, we we can see that there there doesn't we don't need to have like a complex rules set of rules we just need this uh, micro level behavior that is slightly biased and what we see in the macro level um, is this um, in some sense very negative behavior um, then there's been uh, work on, for example, crowd behavior. Um, there uh, is this um, helping paper, I think, was from 98. Um, so uh, to give this kind of simplified overview, um, there's this, there's just, um, there's, there's walls, and then there's kind of these, um, what are they called? Like, openings in different parts of, of the space. And then you set up these different peploids um, with different kind of uh, force principles uh, that are reminiscent of, of basically particle forces. And you give them uh, start velocity and you give them directions. Um, and then you simulate these models and what you see is that, that you kind of see very real life like um, collective movement and, and crowd behavior in physical spaces. Um, and in special cases, you can then simulate this, uh, for example, this, this, this panic moments or, or crowd panic uh, type of situations um, by introducing obstacles into the way. Uh, and this is, this is what, what this, this kind of models, for example, have been used. And they, they seem to produce uh, kind of like real life like effects mm, and are interesting in that sense. Um, 
yeah, this was a kind of a very general overview um, about the, the topic of social dynamics. Um, and it seems that it's a, it's a kind of a vast and a not that well-defined um, area of research. Uh, and as it is, um, this kind of multidisciplinary um, on, the, on the interface of different different research uh, or fields of study it's um, it's not that easy to find um, information about it even uh, in a coherent form uh, but um, summarizing uh, you could say that during the 20th century um, social scientists have recognized the complexity inherent in human society but they have lacked tools to analyze it and there's tools um, in complex systems which provide new alternatives for modeling human societies, uh, where you, you can see this uh, feature of, of complex adaptivity, non-equilibrium phenomena, fat depend dependency, and self-organization uh, as emergence. Um, and some application areas that can be uh, uh, recognized, and these are kind of, uh, outside of economics is opinion dynamics, uh, cultural dynamics, uh, language dynamics. Uh, so for example, these three things, we know that they are, they are very emergent uh, phenomena um, and, and they can, therefore you can kind of make this assumption that similar kind of models can be used. Mm to simulate uh, and emulate this phenomenon. And then growth behavior formation of hierarchies, for example, um, human, human dynamics uh, and social spreading phenomena, which is um, which, uh, and co-evolution of states and topology. So all of these, uh, I think the most modern version might be um, closely related to network science and and it's very um, it's it's more fluid to describe this phenomenon in in terms of networks so for example social spreading phenomena uh, is very very um, topical at the moment uh, due to the corona crisis and i think uh, this in the complex networks course, we were uh, simulating these serial models. For example, if I add an image. Yes. Okay. I think that's pretty much the introduction lecture to social dynamics that I have. Good, very good. Thank you, Willie. Uh, I think it was a very general good talk and <clears throat> it opened plenty of rooms to us. Thank you. So are there any questions? So, uh, if there are no questions, uh, well, can you go to... Well, yeah. maybe I can ask okay. if nobody else. I'm just okay. waiting for mm -hmm. someone else to ask yeah. questions. Um, so, could you, like, tell a bit, like, what kind of sources were you using, especially for this historical overview? Like, mm, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, for example, there's this... Um, Philip Ball's book called Critical Mass. Mm -hmm. um, that's what was used uh, by um, uh, Fortunato as well. Um, so I think Santo Fortunato has been, yeah, 
having this course uh, about mathem uh, mathematical modeling of social dynamics um, here before and this in his introduction lecture he also had this had used the uh, the Philip Ball um, book called critical mass um, and then also there was this um, this this non-equilibrium social sciences um, Springer's um, publication that I read from this historical part, part at least. Yeah, so this Philip Paul's book is like just this kind of popular science kind of book. So if anyone's interested having some light reading over summer or something, then it's yeah. a good recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it's interesting, this kind of historical background. And easy to read as well. Okay, I guess I don't have any other burning questions. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, Mikko, by the way, could you finally find the whole video lectures of, <coughs> uh, what was the name of that guy? Santo. Yeah, Santo. No, I didn't find.